Hello and welcome. My name is Bruce Curtis and I am the head of school for the School of Social Sciences and I'm here to provide you today with an introduction and overview about uh, some of the activities you can do in the School of Social Sciences, some of our subjects, some of our qualifications and some of the support you can receive. Um, when I'm not operating as a uh, head of school, I have an office downstairs from my office as head of school where I am a sociologist. I'm a professor of sociology. And um, when I'm there, I teach and research in the areas of uh, research methods, um, the impact of new technologies, uh, how higher education is um, going to be restructured or is changing over time. And I'm also very interested in um, a new area of research for me, which is the relationship between humans and animals, and in particular, how that relationship is going to change in this period of time that we can call the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a good word that you uh, probably want to um, familiar, so familiarize yourself with. Uh, it refers to an epoch of time or a period of time in which the impacts of humans are the defining characteristic of the planet, planet Earth. So as I've said, I'm going to uh, carry on in this talk uh, and provide you with some overheads about uh, degree structure, um, uh, work integrated learning and how you can get some support. And then when I've completed that, uh, you'll have three or four or five minutes from some of my colleagues, Dr. Christina Hanna, just Dr. Justin Phillips, Professor Katrina Rowan, and that Dr. Dan Weges, and they're going to talk about their areas of research and teaching and specialization. Um, Dr. Hannah is going to talk to you about climate change and strategic retreat. Dr. Phillips is going to talk to you about potentials and risks of big data. Professor Katrina Rowan is going to talk to you about identity, gender, and sexuality. And Dr. Dan Weges is going to talk to you about artificial intelligence. He's calling it AI proofing. Okay, let's start with an overview. I think the best place to start is to say the School of Social Science is a very diverse place uh, where there is lots of potential for you to undertake all different forms of study uh, and uh, all different forms of research later on down the line. If, I've, if we focus on the undergraduate qualifications, the main qualifications I'm gonna to talk to you about today are really about our four of our key degrees or four of our key undergraduate degrees, the Bachelor of Arts, the Bachelor of Environmental Planning, the Bachelor of Social Sciences, and the Bachelor of Social Work. So they're four of the key degrees that the vast majority of our students uh, do um, in their first three or four years at university. When we think about those degrees, there are a range of subjects you can do those degrees in, or actually, actually the other way around, you can do those subjects in a number of those degrees. You can do them in anthropology, environment and society, environment planning, I won't read the list, but all the way from anthropology down to sociology. Now, some of those subjects you can take as majors, and I will list those, anthropology, environmental planning, geography, history, philosophy, political science, sociology, and social policy. Those majors are um, subjects that you would get your degree in for example, you might do a Bachelor of Social Science in Sociology or a Bachelor of Social Science in Geography. You could also do um, uh, a Bachelor of Arts in History or you could even do a Bachelor of Arts in Social Policy. There's a lot of flexibility there in being able to mix and match between the degrees and the subjects and in particular the majors. You can also, if you're feeling keen, um, talk about uh, a minor. Now, our subjects are divided into majors and minors, and here's a simple looking degree structure. This would apply for any of our three year degrees. And if you can look, if you look at this outline, you can see we have the red colored papers, which are the papers that are the majors in your degree. And then uh, we have um, some, uh, gray colored papers, which are your other compulsory papers that we feel that you need to do to be able to complete the degree. And then you've got a range of black or dark gray papers, which you can either use as electives or free papers, or you can do something called a minor. Now a minor is 
all the subjects that aren't majors is a simple way of saying it. So you could, for example, have a Bachelor of Social Science majoring in philosophy with a minor in ethics. Or um, there's, a, there's a remarkable number of combinations. I won't go through all of them. Um, the other option, of course, is for you to um, do a double major in your degree. And here it's quite a simple sort of arrangement. You've got, um, you could major in a BA or a BSOC Sci, Bachelor of Social Science. Say you could major in geography and history or social policy and philosophy or sociology and anthropology. There are lots of very common um, um, arrangements. Um, this is the best way to get the most value out of your degree, I have to say. Costing you no more money, um, but it means that you can structure your degree and have two majors in your degree. Very useful. So, I mean, that's an overview that I've taken about two minutes, if that, to talk about, and I don't expect you um, to be able to uh, grab that immediately. Um, we have quite uh, extensive student support here, available here in the school, uh, and the four email addresses down the bottom there are the key addresses that you should be emailing to if you want any assistance whatsoever uh, in terms of enrolling or in terms of your ongoing participation at the university. Um, it's just a simple matter of sending that e those four email addresses an inquiry and you will get a pretty much immediate response. We have um, quite a large uh, behind the scenes group of people that are there to provide care, pastoral support, student advice to students. And I urge you, if you're interested in any aspect uh, of the university to, to write to one of those four addresses or to write to more than one of those four addresses. So I briefly touched upon the degree structure here, very briefly, of our subjects, which are broken up into majors and minors, and we've got degrees that you can do those majors and minors in. Another thing that we uh, have at this university and that we are very proud of, and in fact, I think we are a New Zealand leader in this, is something that we're calling work integrated learning. Work integrated learning is something that is made available to students in their third year of study. So it's a couple of years away yet for, the, for those of you who think about enrolling. But uh, you can, this is about making you work ready uh, to, to allow you to build networks, to actually move beyond uh, the university con uh, context to get a job. Some of our Students, some of you might decide that the next step you want to take is for further study and in further study beyond that and, and in fact uh, aim for uh, a career in academia. The majority of students probably will work in a job outside the university context, the great majority of students will. And this work integrated learning is a way in which we're trying to help you prepare to make those decisions. Um, you can do two sorts of work integrated learning activities. Um, you can either undertake what we call a work placement, where you actually work at the place of work uh, uh, of an employer, and you would work there for around about 100 hours in a trimester. Uh, or you can um, do a project here on campus at the university. Um, both of these options count towards the um, qualifications and the points that you need to complete your degree. But uh, the University of Waikato is the only university in New Zealand that offers every one of its students a chance to do work integrated learning. Um, and I think it's a pretty good opportunity. Um, we have a, a little screen here that says, why choose Waikato? I'm supposed to, hopefully I've ticked off some of these. Work integrated learning I've talked about, a very flexible degree structure. Uh, I haven't mentioned the huge range of scholarships, but they are very extensive. We have, uh, quite a few benefactors to the university uh, that have set up scholarships that are available to different sorts of students. And the university puts aside a considerable amount of money to facilitate and help students coming into the university context. Um, and that is really worth ex exploring. And one, they might even be one of the questions that you might ask some of those support uh, people that I showed in the, uh, with the set of emails. Um, the other one is uh, award-winning lecturers. Um, and their world-class education. You're going to hear a bit more about those award-winning lecturers uh, in the sections following me. And indeed, I think you've got four of some of the best 
researchers and lecturers in New Zealand talking to you after me. It's a great campus and we have fantastic student accommodation and we're building that student accommodation all the time. We're very keen for students to um, come to campus, stay on campus, have a, a great campus experience. It's very much focused about a, a good university, a good student experience. Um, I mean, I've got a, a little phrase about why you'd come to the University of Waikato. It hasn't made it into our marketing material, but I would say that the University of Waikato was all about taking the local global and at the same time making the global local. Maybe that's a bit sort of neat and tidy, but I, I, I think that's where this university is lead, leading edge in New Zealand, that interaction between local and global, global and local. Um, and I think it's a pretty exciting place to be. Okay, I have, looks like I've actually managed to make it through in the three or four minutes that I was uh, given to talk about. Here are some key dates for you. Um, the main one, I guess, is that applications are open now. So uh, if you're interested in applying, go back to those contact addresses that I spoke about four or five slides ago and start emailing those. Go to the university website uh, and start um, making your application there. Uh, and um, you can see that the uh, applications for the halls are open already, but they're going to be open for another six weeks. So there's plenty of time to make applications if you want to stay in the hall of residence. If you want to make an application for a scholarship, it would be good to do so as soon as possible. Our um, formal closing date for those scholarships is the 31st of August. So um, I would, if you're interested in finding out more about scholarships, uh, you should contact those um, contact emails I gave you earlier on. You might be able to hear my cat in the background who's just decided and, and decided to come sit on my lap. Anyway, um, I will say goodbye now. I wish you all the best of luck. And the next voice you hear should be Dr. Christina Hanna, who's going to be talking about uh, changes in the environment and the notion of strategic retreat. Thank you very much and very best of luck. Kia ora koutou, it's Dan Veyas here from the Philosophy Programme, and I'm here to tell you that everything you thought you knew about getting a degree in order to get a job is wrong. I don't blame you. Everyone's been telling you that medicine, law, accounting, business, they're the things that you need to study if you want to be sure you're going to get a job or a good job after you finish. Well, that's just wrong. Uh, Unfortunately, they probably haven't been thinking too much about what's happening with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these other advances that we're seeing around us. Basically, machines, especially artificially intelligent machines, are very good at following rules, remembering lists of things, and they're the kinds of things that you'll do in medicine, in law, in accounting, and business. Um, they're also very good at discovering patterns and working out what makes people buy certain things just by looking at the actual facts of what's happened because a lot of the transactions are online. So that's business um, covered off. Accounting is effectively just following rules and applying the rules to some data that you already have. A lot of law is just putting the different person's name into a template. Any, anyone can do that. A lot of medicine is remembering lists of symptoms uh, and knowing what um, condition is likely to be coming out of those symptoms. So when you're at your GP and you're talking to them, um, they may be tapping in notes about what you're saying, but they may also be tapping in uh, your symptoms to see what WebMD has to say about what you might have. So when you think about it, um, artificial intelligence and computers programs are so good at doing all of these things, but there's some things that they're not so good at doing, and there's some things that they can't do. So all of the artificial intelligence machine learning is constrained by certain parameters, certain rules, and certain goals. But who comes up with those goals and those rules? Well, I would say it's people who are good at thinking critically, thinking creatively, and thinking holistically. Now, these are the kinds of thinking skills that will help you in the kinds of jobs that AI and other forms of technology can't do. So I call them AI-proof thinking skills. Critical thinking, creative thinking, and holistic thinking. If you can do those things well, you'll be ready to do all the jobs that aren't sucked up by all um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And they're the kinds of skills that you'll learn when you study social sciences. Social sciences involve thinking about human values and other values, as well as scientific evidence, bringing them together to look at complex issues and try and solve those complex issues using multiple methods. Now, importantly, 
who makes the rules and who sets the goals for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now that's the kind of thing that they shouldn't be doing for themselves. That's the kind of thing people with critical, creative and holistic thinking skills should be doing. People who have had experience thinking about different values and weighing them up with the scientific evidence to work out what is the thing that we should do here in this complex situation. If you study social sciences, you'll have those skills. You'll have AI-proof thinking skills and you'll be ready to hit the workplace and you'll be doing the jobs in which you make the rules rather than the jobs in which you follow the rules. So if you want to make the rules instead of follow the rules, you should study social sciences. Because if you just end up following the rules, you should know there'll be a machine out there that can do your job a lot better than you and your career may not be a long one. Kora koto. My name is Christina and I'm a lecturer in environmental planning. Today I will be briefly discussing one of our many research areas that we teach in order to prepare you for working in a changing world. As I'm sure you are aware, we are living in a state of compounding crises with our health, climate, ecosystems and housing to name a few. Humanity's impact on the earth is so profound that we now term this geologic era the Anthropocene, the age of human-induced change. It can be overwhelming to hear the evidence of humanity's impact on the planet, but this is a story of hope. You just have to bear with me for a little bit. Humans have caused vast extinctions of animals and plants, polluted the air, soil and water with plastic, made vast bodies of water uninhabitable, drained and sealed masses of hectares of land for sprawling urban centres and private transportation. Global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels in the next decade if we continue along our current emissions pathway. Beyond 1.5 degrees of warming, we will not be able to avoid catastrophic impacts of climate change. As environmental planners, we aim to protect, preserve and enhance the natural and built environments to help address these socio-ecological crises from housing to transport, national parks, waterways and farmland, planners manage how we use and deal with our natural and physical resources. However, for climate change in particular, reducing our impacts will not be enough, as much of the warming is cooked into the system already, and we are having to adapt to a new normal, as you can see on this slide. In Aotearoa, this new normal includes rising sea levels, an increase in floods and droughts, changing wind and rainfall patterns, increased temperatures and more pressure on our ecosystems. But rather than succumbing to climate doomism, we must use the tools and skills we have available to adapt. Humans, and particularly in indigenous communities, have adapted to environmental change throughout history. Using our forward-thinking, strategic planning skills, we can reimagine the form and nature of our settlements and create opportunities to build resilience into our complex living systems. Strategic retreat is an example of working with rather than against nature. By strategically withdrawing unsustainable development from risky spaces, we can create buffers for environmental change and ensure ecosystems have space to migrate inland as sea level encroaches on coastal margins. Whilst relocating homes, businesses and infrastructure will require significant sacrifices to change the way we use certain land areas here via retreat, it will reduce future emergency management costs and in some cases enable us to restore nature's regulating functions such as wetlands. Developing climate resilient pathways creates hope for the future, enabling us to create adaptive learning, increase scientific knowledge and undertake effective adaptation and mitigation measures and other choices that reduce risk. Strategic retreat is just one of the many ways to adapt to a changing environment and move along these climate resilient pathways. And we look forward to developing your skills to create innovative and adaptive solutions for a more resilient future. Thanks for listening and if you'd like to check us out on Instagram and Facebook, have a look at Planning, planning Waikato. Thank you. Kia ora, I'm Katrina Rowan and I'm going to tell you about three of the subject areas that you might choose within the School of Social Sciences. 
Gender and Sexuality Studies is a minor that you can take as part of your degree program. In Gender and Sexuality Studies, we discuss questions like, why do schools struggle to make sexuality education interesting and worthwhile for students? If you think back over your years at school, I wonder, do you have good memories of sexuality education? Was this topic addressed at school in a way that you found inspiring and informative? In many places, this topic is hardly taught at all. When it is taught, it's often not taught well. Why is this? These kinds of questions open up all sorts of opportunities that we can think about in gender and sexuality studies. For instance, we might explore the implications for how young people are taught about sexuality. What are the consequences in societies where these kinds of topics are simply not taught well? Another example of a question that we address in gender and sexuality studies is, how have popular representations of masculinity changed over time? Think about this for a moment. When I say the word masculinity, what does it make you think of? What is masculinity? Is it something we do? Can anyone do masculinity? Or is it something we are? Is masculinity the same in different parts of the world? Researchers have examined masculinity in different times and places, and their work helps us to think about the concept of masculinity and how it relates to our day-to-day -day lives. In gender and sexuality studies, we explore opportunities for empowerment and social change. We learn about social movements and ideas such as environmental feminism or intersex advocacy. One of the social movements we read and talk about is mana wahine, which is a part of Māori or indigenous thinking about gender, cultural identity and empowerment. Students who take gender and sexuality studies love the way that this paper makes them think differently about the world around them and about their day-to-day -day lives. We have fascinating classroom discussions and everyone does a project that involves putting some of their new ideas they're learning into practice in their lives. In the School of Social Sciences, you can also do degrees in sociology or social policy. Studying sociology at Waikato, you will learn about how societies work and you'll have the chance to talk about all kinds of social issues with other students in the relaxed and interactive learning environment. In sociology, we are interested in how social justice issues work as well as understanding the structure of society. We focus on thematic areas such as criminology, popular culture, activism and social change. We also teach papers on globalization and on the body and embodiment, for example. If you choose to study social policy, you'll learn about how policy making affects everyone across age, gender and culture, and you'll learn how to influence policy. Students who study with us love social policy because they get to debate how social problems arise and what can be done to address those problems. Studying social policy opens up a wide range of job possibilities for students, whether you're interested in working for government agencies or voluntary or community organisations, for example. I suggest that you check out the social policy papers we teach on topics like health, welfare, the family, or our papers on addressing precarity or female imprisonment. If you join us studying, whether you choose to study sociology, social policy, or gender and sexuality studies, or any combination of these, you will consider how different groups in society view social reality, and you'll consider how societies change over time. We look forward to meeting you on your journey through study at the University of Waikato.